is issues dealing with social influence. You know, so far in, uh, especially a Psych 101 course, where much of the focus is placed on the individual, the individual's development, the individual's personality, the individual's emotional and motivational and psychological state. And it's those individual dispositions that a lot of individuals believe creates behavior. Um, and that really is the idea that the individual is completely and totally responsible for their own behaviors, the production of some type of behavior, whether it's good or it's bad, is not only the basis of psychology, it's the basis of entire social sciences, the criminal justice system, the political system, that really we should only hold the individual who created a given behavior responsible for that behavior. And to a lot of degrees, that is true, that the person who produces a behavior should be held responsible, but if we truly want to understand what creates behavior, we have to look beyond the individual. And that's really what social psychology is about. And, and the way to kind of think of how this is constructed is it is true, your individual personality, your emotions, your affect, drive you to given situations that may be different than other people. So some of you are uh, physically strong, athletic, so you're more likely or you probably have a disposition towards uh, physical activity. Some of you are deep thinkers. Um, and so that might uh, drive you towards more intellectual endeavors. But once we're in those places, it's important to understand that what determines behavior in a given situation is a product of not only the individual, but the social aspects of the situation itself. Who's there? Who's at play? What are the authority figures? What is the environment? And it is those, all, all those exterior situational factors that also determine behavior. So, for example, I always, uh, uh, always like to bring up the personality factor of extroversion versus introversion. Um, extroversion is uh, people who tend to be very social. They get a lot of their energy from being in social situations and interacting with other people, and that's how they do their best problem solving. Introverts, on the other hand, get their energy and their source of, of sol problem solving from uh, solitude, being in a quiet, non-social place, okay? Both individuals are capable of get, getting up and doing a speech, a public speech, okay? Given the social and situational factors that are at play. But although they both produce the same behaviors, they'll give a different reason for why. One will use their extroversion, the other one will use their introversion to explain why they did their behaviors. And that is what makes social psychology interesting, is we take the individual, but we go beyond the situation, beyond the individual, and look at what are the situational and social factors that also influence behavior. Um, and so I always like to start with this because uh, we're going to talk uh, more in depth. We started to talk when I first came to you guys a little bit about conformity and obedience to authority. We watched a, a Philip Zimbardo video, uh, but I wanted to go more in depth into that today. And, and I'd like to say that, first of all, in normal social situation, conformity and following others and stuff like that is not a bad thing. Uh, it's, it's what keeps us driving the road and keeps us safe most of the time. It's what keeps orders in classrooms and the workplace. Um, it makes it so we get in line so that we get through things in an orderly way. So most of the time, conformity and the like is actually very helpful. 
but we also have to understand that there is also the dark side of conformity and uh, obedience to authority figures. And that's kind of where we're going to go today. And so I always like to start um, because there's always one that will in a classroom with the question is, would you cuddle with and then shock a cute cuddly puppy dog with 450 volts of electricity? I'm willing to bet there's one of you, and if I look at the camera and ask you to raise your hand, there'd always be one, but the majority of you would say no, I think. Okay, uh, because why that sadistic behavior? Um, but as we'll see later, uh, if the situation is correct, we'll see how much someone would actually be willing to do that. And I like this lecture because it gets, gives me the opportunity to prove that women are more evil than men, but we will get to that in just a minute. So since we're going to talk about the dark side of, of, of conformity and the social situation, I want to give kind of a definition of evil or violence, okay? First of all, we need to start with the premise that evil and violence is not a disease of the mind or the individual, but a disease of the situation, community, and society. And that's kind of where we're going to go with this conversation, and we'll show how the social situation, if there's the right factors there, people who are uh, not deranged, not sociopaths or psychopaths, can engage in uh, pretty horrific behaviors. And to do that, we're gonna start by talking about social influence, okay? Social influence is the myriad of ways that people impact one another including changes of attitudes, beliefs, feelings, and behaviors that results from comments, actions, or even mere presence of others. So this is kind of the, the definition of social influence. Um, and it's really about how much can someone influence your attitude, beliefs, and feelings just by being there. And there's really three types of conformity. We have conformity itself, and that's a change of one's behaviors or belief in response to explicit or implicit pressure. Uh, and uh, if you remember, when I first came in and talked to you guys, I talked about how at 2 a.m. we still stop at a red stoplight, even though there's no one else around. And if you're like me, you'll still wait for it to turn green. And that's what we mean by the implicit or imagined presence of others, is just the idea of someone uh, finding us not following the rules makes us conform to that given situation. Compliance is response favorably to the explicit request of others, and obedience is when you have an unequal power relationship where one individual submits to the power of the other person. And that's really kind of what we're going to talk about here in the first part of this lecture is this issue of obedience. Okay. When we talk about social influence, there's a series of experiments that were conducted. And the first one was the Sharif studies. And what Sharif wanted to really know is what does the mere presence of other people, how does that influence the, the behaviors of others? And so what he did, if you could imagine that uh, you're all in a dark room and that the only thing you can see is this little red dot on the screen, okay? And what you're asked to do is you're asked to stare at that little red dot for one to two minutes. Now, this is a fixed red dot. It's not going to move anywhere. But after about 30 seconds of staring at this red dot um, in a dark room, what you'll see is the red dot will start moving back and forth. Okay. This process is called the autokinetic effect. It, it has to deal with the nerves in our eyes 
when we're focused on a pinpoint of light, it will burn out one cell and it will start to say, tell the other cells around it that that image is still there, so they will light up. They'll start to fire. And what that creates is a visual illusion of this little red dot moving back and forth. The interesting thing that we knew about the autokinetic effect before Sharif is the amount of movement of the light is really dependent upon the individual. So for example, um, I might see the light move one to two inches, where your professor might see it move six inches and you might see it move 12 inches back and forth. And so we know that individuals will see a difference in uh, the, the, the length of the, the amount. And sure enough, when we ask individuals how much they saw individually, we got this very varied amount, two inches, six inches, a half an inch, a foot, and it was very varied. But what was interesting is when we had people answer as a group, so we'd start with, we'd turn the lights on and we'd start with person one and they would announce how much they saw it, person two. And what was interesting is as we asked individuals in the room, the amount that people saw the light moved stopped varying to where we have, a, you know, if we have like a, I think we have eight individuals in the room, right? I think six, yeah. we'll say eight. So by about the fourth person, everyone after that started conforming to let's say one inch. And so the variation depended upon the social information that people provided, okay? What Sharif's study came to, came to know that the, the type of social influences that, that, that he discovered was what's called informational social influence. And this is influence stemming from the need for information in a situation which the correct action or judgment is really uncertain. So we don't have it, that little red light, something telling us for sure how much we saw the red light move. And so we use the information of other people to make a judgment about how much we saw it. So in situations where we're uncertain and we're not sure, we'll look towards other people to determine what is the appropriate action or what the pro appropriate response would be. And again, we talked a little bit about that on Monday. Now, the Shree study is kind of about this ambiguous um, situation where, where, where there's this fixed thing and there's really no judgment calling, okay? And so the next study was done by Ash. And what Ash wanted to know is, do people conform to the judgments of other people? And so what he did is he traditionally had a line of seven individuals, and uh, they go from left to right. The first six individuals worked for the experimenter, meaning they were going to give a predetermined answer to Ash's uh, request. It's the seventh person that was the person in the experiment, and it was that person's response that we were most interested in. But what Ash would do is he would go in front of people, of this, this group of seven individuals, and sometimes it was five, sometimes it was three, and he would ask, he would have these cards, and he'd ask, in the standard line, line A, what line does this equal? Is it the same length as line one, two, or three? Some of the time he would have the, the people working for him give the right answer, and some of the times he would have them give the wrong answer. And sometimes the wrong answer was really extreme. So for example, sometimes they would pair the line A with line three, even though it's obvious that this line three is much shorter than line A. 
And uh, what Ash wanted to know is would the seventh person conform to the other six individuals' responses? And interestingly, in his, response, his results, 75% of uh, the, the participants conformed at least some of the time in the first judgment, 75% of the people, even when it was obviously wrong, would initially agree with the other six individuals. Interestingly, about a third or 37%, even after the experimenter said you're all wrong, about a third of individuals would actually argue with the experimenter saying that their group's judgment must be correct uh, because we all agreed upon it even though the experimenter is showing them the error that they made. So there's a couple things that this shows. Well, first of all, this is what uh, Ash called normative social influence. This is influence from the desire to gain approval to avoid the disapproval of others. So we conform to the opinions of the larger group in order to seek approval from that group. And we will do that in, in, in these terms about 75% of the time. And about a third of us will con continue uh, to conform to that group's uh, situation, even after it's proven that that group is incorrect. Um, some have argued that this is, this, this is kind of the uh, statistical proof of people who become extremists in very wrong ideals, because we know that when a, a, a belief system or a system is, is being attacked, usually it's about a third of the individuals that take on an extremist perspective and will defend that belief system well beyond its, its, uh, it, it not being proved anymore. So, um, okay. So Ash's study is about judgments of others and will we conform to the judgments of others? And, and Ash's research has been repeated uh, a couple times over the, the centuries. I shouldn't say a couple times over the last couple decades. It's actually been uh, reproduced in almost every social psychology class. Um, a couple things that should be noted is that this conformity rate of 75% has slightly actually gone down. I think the last uh, research I saw that reproduced these results, it went down to about 68%, uh, but still well above 50% of people still will conform to the wrong judgment of a group, at least initially. Any questions? A question for can you hear me yes okay um this study was done uh here in the u.s correct correct okay have they done similar studies in different cultural contexts they have they did uh they reproduced these results in Europe, germany and great britain um in Asian countries, uh, more collective type of countries, we actually find these conformity numbers actually go up. So, uh, so for for in the cultural context of individualism versus collectivism, which are the two big cultural variables, we find that in individualistic cultures, these numbers still remain pretty consistent. Uh, and and right now, with these reproduced numbers, it's around 65 and above. But we find in collective societies, so we're talking Middle Eastern, Eastern countries, Asian countries, uh, they, they go up clear into the 90 to 95 percent um, range when it comes to the social conformity uh, results. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? All right. 
So these were really two of the landmark studies that um, uh, kind of showed that indeed people around us have a in huge influence on the judgments that we make. Um, but I do want to just say something before we move on because these numbers uh, are scary, but we still have to remember that there are still that small percentage of individuals who did not conform to the social situation. And I always like to think of this in, in, in the positive areas, right? Uh, for example, uh, standing in a bank line or a grocery line, right? That's a pro-social conformity behavior, but there's always those individuals who are willing to cut in front of the lines or to try and get in front of other people uh, in traffic, most everybody drives pretty consistently, but there's always those certain individuals who don't conform to those, those uh, social norms. So one, there are people who uh, definitely break this, this evil conformity issue of, of making judgments wrongly, but uh, the conformity issue kind of is, goes both ways even with positive uh, conformity behaviors. Um, there are some different, uh, so a lot of these research uh, things have been altered to see if uh, you can increase or decrease the conformity rates. And there are some variables that do influence how much individuals will, will conform. So one is uh, anonymity of the group. It was easier for participants not to conform if one other person disagreed with the group. So if there's at least one dissenter in a group of seven, uh, you lowered this rate of 75% significantly. We also found that the mode of response uh, uh, had a huge impact. Um, in fact, if you do things by secret ballot, uh, the conformity rate is almost non-existent. Um, and then we've also found the variable of status. There's greater conformity was shown by participants of lower status than of groups of members who wanted to be part of the group. Um, and what, what this means is within a group situation, uh, individuals who have the lowest status in the group, so maybe a new member to the group or someone who was given a position um, that isn't as high in the group, those individuals tended to conform more than the individuals who were already a part of the group and had more status within the group. So where you are within the group setting uh, has an influence on these conformity results as well. So the next person to come along, and, and again, we watched this uh, uh, with the Zimbardo video, so I won't go into the great details of, of the obedience uh, studies by uh, Milgram, but just to kind of give a refresher, um, uh, Milgram was uh, from Jewish descent and he, uh, his family, his relatives definitely were impacted by the concentration camps of the Nazi regime uh, during World War II. And what Milgram uh, knew about Germany and the German people is that before World War II, uh, Jews and Germans were, got along quite well and Germans were actually quite friendly. Um, it wasn't until they, they built this extremist view that those types of things changed. And so Milgram wanted to know what could make such a mass number of people do such horrific evils. And uh, so he wanted to know, could, could, could Nazism, could that occur here in the United States? So he came up with what's now known as the Milgram Studies. And the Milgram Studies is a, a, a study on the obedience to authority. And just to kind of give a refresher, you have a teacher and you have a student. It was established as a learning uh, experiment. Uh, the, and, and you were, 
you assumed if you were a participant that you were randomly assigned to either be the teacher or the learner, but in reality, as the participant, you were always gonna be a learner, it was rigged. And the, so, no, you were always gonna be the teacher, I apologize. So no matter what, you were always gonna be the teacher and the learner was always gonna be the, the person working for the experiment. And so the learner went in the other room, they strapped him down with some fake uh, um, electric shock apparatuses, and they came along and did, uh, uh, and, and the learner was told every time the person gets a, a something wrong, you shock him with a shock uh, apparatus. The apparatus started at 15 volts and it increased in 15 volt increments clear up to 450 volts. And under 450 volts, it said XXX, danger, warning of potential death, okay? And what Milgram wanted to know is how many people would actually go clear up to 450 volts. And um, when he went to all of the psychiatrists and psychologists and asked, what should his hypothesis be? What should his educated guess be? They all told him one to 2% will go up to 450 volts because they knew that only about one to 2% of our population are sadistic. And as the story goes, he couldn't have been more wrong. In fact, what we find if we look here, it, over, over all of the cases, and there was a thousand different uh, samples, 65% uh, overall went clear up to 450 volts. And so what does this suggest according to Milgram? It suggests that people will obey authority even up to the point of death, okay? Of, of, of potentially, potential death. Now, there are some caveats to this. Are there situations in which uh, you can reduce these rates? And the answer is, is yes. Um, and this just kind of shows the progression. Um, if you can see the person being shocked, that reduces the rate to about 50%. If there's another person in the room who stops, only 10% will go up to 450 volts. If you see another person go up to 450 volts, 90% of people will go up to 450 volts. So the situational factors in the room really are what determine whether the majority, 90% uh, or a few 10% or the average 65% will actually go all the way up to the 450 volts. Um, and I think, again, uh, when we met uh, that first time, I did mention that the, these results have been what's called partially reproduced, um, and the conformity rates have definitely not gone down. The last time this uh, research was partially um, did was back in 2015, and I think their conformity rate was 68%. So is there any questions on the Milgram study before I go on? I have one. <laughs> this is no steps to me. I'm loving it. Okay, so what's the motivation for obedience? What what created what created these people um, to to have a sadistic behavior to create pain? What was the pressure for obedience? You're talking about obedience to some authority figure. Um, what was the consequence if they didn't obey? Well, th that's the interesting thing is there was no consequences to them not obeying. One, they were paid for the experiment at the beginning of the experiment. And two, they were told they could stop at any time. But they still kept on. But they still kept going. But here, here's the interesting thing is, is that if you listen to the transcript of the experimenter, the one who's the authority figure, they encourage them and when the, the, the individual asks, will I be responsible for this? The authority figure says, no, I'll take responsibility, you continue on. 
teacher. So you see a lot of issues such as diffusion of responsibility. Uh, you see a lot of issues, and, and actually, <laughs> actually, uh, there's actual nine lessons we learned, and I think this might answer your question: is what can, what are the nine things that need to be in place to create such high rates of conformity? Um, and the first one is the contractual obligation. You came here to finish a task. You're put in a meaningful role, such as a teacher. That's a position of authority and meaning, well, at least back then. Um, the rules need to make sense, but they need to be ambiguous. So the experimenter said in the beginning, you can leave at any time, so that makes sense but any time is very ambiguous, right? Um, use of semantics, so uh, in the, 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 the experimenter said, uh, con he never said continue on hurting the student. He said continue on teacher, the task must be completed. So the use of semantics, if we look back at uh, Nazi Germany, uh, extermination of the Jews, they were never called killers, they were called heroes of Germany, uh, the people who worked in those concentration camps. We see diffusion of responsibility, so uh, don't worry, teacher, I'll be responsible, you don't, you just continue on. Small incremental acts, this is one thing that uh, Milgram doesn't discuss much about, but when he test ran this experiment, he started with 450 volts, and no one would do it. It wasn't until he started with those small incremental amounts that you could get people to do that. Again, gradual progression, exit, ex, exit costs are high and difficult, so in this situation, you have the, the uh, authority figure encouraging the person, saying, no, nah, you don't want to leave, you can continue on. And then probably the ninth one, which is the big one, is offering an, that should say, an ideology or a big idea. So for Nazi Germany, for example, it was, we're going to create the best, most superior race on earth that is going to lead us to a millennia of peace and prosperity. What a huge idea. And all we have to do is get rid of these certain populations. In the Milgram studies, it's this, this experiment was, we want to be able to teach people, teach students, teach children in the most effective means possible. And here is your opportunity to help. And you can show us and help us develop better teaching techniques that will create a better, more well-educated society. That's how this was sold to many of the participants who participated in the Milgram study. So does, does that make sense on, uh, on that end? This would fit too with um, some of the dangerous religious cults and the yeah. terrorism and ISIS and all kinds of good stuff. Yeah, yeah, in fact, this experiment has been uh, um, uh, related to the George Jones, uh, I don't think it's jo Jonestown. It's not George Jones, he's a senior. Uh, uh, Jonestown <laughs> massacres where 919 people committed suicide at the request of, of, of their leader. So yeah, it definitely uh, applies to cult societies and, and the like. So I, I asked about what about those puppy dogs, okay? And this is where we're going to get into a dis, uh, discussion about different types of authority figures. Uh, what uh, I believe this is King and Sheridan, and this was the early 80s where they did this experiment, is they wanted to know if they could reproduce the Milgram results if the individuals had a relationship with the authority figure. 
Um, and because Milgram's uh, experiments were considered really unethical because it's humans, instead of using humans, they use puppy dogs, okay? So this is what King and Sheridan did in the early 80s. They brought these puppy dogs to a high school, and I believe they used some freshman college classrooms at the end of the semester, and they selected classes where the students had to develop a relationship with their teacher or instructor, meaning they had to get to know each other in some capacity other than just lecture and student. Um, and what they did is they brought these puppies in and the, and the, the students were able to play with them and, and get to know them. And then they were put in this apparatus, this box, and the doggies were strapped down with what was supposed to be shocking apparatuses. Now I gotta tell everybody, none of the dogs were shocked. Uh, they were all trained to react to a sound, a little buzzing sound. So they would just kind of freeze whenever they heard the buzzing sound, which looked like they were being shocked, but they weren't actually being shocked. Um, and what they, the students were instructed is they provided some instructions on how to train a dog, and they were supposed to train the dog to do certain tasks. Now, the dogs were trained not to learn these tasks. So here we have the situation, we have the authority figure, the teacher, who has a well-established relationship with their students. They've been told to do this. What's going to be the results? And it's interesting, when you have a relationship with the authority figure, conformity rate actually goes up to 75%. But what's interesting in the Sheridan and King puppy experiments is that there was actually a gender difference. In the Milgram study, when the authority figure was an unknown individual, both men and women went to two thirds, about 60, 67%, I think it was. But when it came to having a relationship with an authority figure, we see a gender difference where 100% of females would go up to 450 volts and 54% of males would go up to 100. 450 volts. Now, I want to be careful because I said this proves, right, that women are more evil than men. Look at 100% of the women, they're evil people. But uh, <laughs> I, we can't save these males too much because the 46% of males who did not shock the puppy all the way were not they're heroes. They didn't go, no, I won't do this because it's wrong. No, I'm not doing this because it's hurting this poor little puppy. No, the 46% of males made excuses. So they said something like, well, the battery's dead, or the dog performed all the tricks when the dog really didn't. In other words, the 46% of the males who didn't go up made an excuse of why they couldn't complete the task all the way to 450 volts, okay? So what does this suggest? And, and maybe uh, Dr. Valdez, you can give me some responses from students. What does this suggest when we have a relationship with an authority figure? More influential yeah. because of the relationship. Yeah. Can you hear us? I can't hear you, no. Okay, so I'm going to speak for you. What do you want me to tell? I just said respect. So we're thinking about the concept of respect that with that relationship becomes more, more respect and maybe a more commitment. Mm -hmm. Maybe commitment to please. Mm -hmm. They're all shaking their head. Yeah. What What about this gender difference? Why do you think? Why don't you think females came up with ex didn't come up with excuses for not completing the task? Why do you think they just went ahead? Now I do have to say I, I'm going to say this right away. 
none of these students, and, and this is what I kind of feel like made this study a little bit unethical. None of these students, including the male, were sitting on flipping it with a smile on their face. No, if you watch some of the original reels from this, there were tears. There was crying. Um, but they still, despite that emotion of knowing what I'm doing is hurting something, uh, we, we still see this high obedience rate. Why do you think in this situation there is this gender difference, though? I say ability to express their emotions, like because guys probably weren't, or were the guys crying, or was it just females? In, in some of the videos, the guys, well, the guys weren't crying, but there was obvious signs of distress. I say it's because of that. They gave up because they couldn't handle the emotion, and the females showed it. What do you think, Ghana? Because I have another idea. All right, let's hear it. All right, so the more relationship that a woman has with an authority figure, um, the more the more of an oppressive dynamic there is with women instead of men so it was easier for men to say nah i ain't doing this without the fear of that repercussion and the men feeling being able to feel more independent of having a voice whereas women are more oppressed and and are more concerned about disappointing that person in authority that they have a relationship with mm -hmm. Guys don't want to ask for direction. Oh, <laughs> guys don't want to ask for direction, she said. Yeah, that's a, that's a possibility. One, one of the things that uh, Sheridan King, and I think all of your comments are lead to this, is they, they suggest that social relationships have traditionally been more important to females than they are for males. And so it might be something like this. So let me ask you this. So, so this is one research, like I said, this was done in the early 80s. And unlike the Milgram studies, this study has never been uh, reproduced. Do you guys think, given the changing dynamics of males and females in our society, do you think these results would be the same? Or do you think they would be different? <laughs> I heard part of it. Okay, basically what Tajik was saying is that um, uh, now compared to in the 80s, um, the women um, feel like maybe they would have more of a voice and would be more resistant and that both the males and the females, their percentages might be lower and actually females might significantly drop so that at least they're more equivalent with males. I don't yeah. know. Okay. And I kind of agree with that because when we look at the early 80s, is when we really started seeing a lot of the social reforms that we have today. So it was the early 80s where we get the Violence Against Women Act, we get the development of domestic violence shelters and stuff. And so we start to see this release from these social pressures that traditionally have inhibited women for making moral decisions more on their own. So I kind of feel, it from my perspective, that I agree with with him that I think these numbers would be different today than they were then. What do you think, Dr. Valdez? Yeah, I agree. I'm also wondering if the people in authority were they were they um, 
equal gender, 50-50, male-female, or I think the gender of the authority figure can have some impact too. I believe they did vary the gender of the, the, the so it was a male or female teacher. I think they did vary it. How much, I'm not sure. I'd have to look again, so. But kind of an interesting thought, right, is, is that, uh, you know, when we come to get to know our leaders, when we come to get to know our authority figures, we kind of become a little bit more blinded than when that authority figure is just someone we don't know, right? All right. And so I just want to bring this up because uh, one time I was teaching a Psych 101 class, and this was years ago. Um, and they just were not giving in to this whole authority thing that the social situation could influence their thoughts or their processes. And so this is just kind of an example of, of, of how we can unknowingly um, do things. And it's a lesson for you guys in your college career that I want you to take home from this example. So what I did is I, I was trying to think, how can I get these guys to understand that they can be hugely influenced by authorities and, and really take it? And I was walking to class and I came up and I said, why don't I give a bogus lecture on personality? And I came up, I thought it was genius. I think I should have wrote a book, but I came up with this 45 minute lecture on the relationship between the size of your foot, the shape, the shape of your toes, and different personality factors. So if you had a long toes, it meant you were extroverted, and, and if you had wide feet, it meant that you were you, you enjoyed variety of experience. All of this really, I'm gonna use this word bull crap. Okay. And I gave this lecture 45 minutes. But the dependent measure, what I wanted to know, actually came a week later in a quiz that I gave to my students. And at the end of the quiz, it had one open-ended question. It asked, do you think that the foot theory of personality is a valid theory? And it had a range of strongly disagree to strongly agree. How many individuals do you guys think said agree to strongly agree? Okay. So this was a class of 25 and a 92% put agree to strongly agree that the foot does determine your personality. All right, so there's a lesson in this with your college career that I really want to point out. Make sure that if you hear something in a class that you don't take it at face value. Make sure you fact check everything and you should do that with all of life. When you listen to a piece of news, when you hear something from any type of authority figure, from a professor or anything, I encourage you to go fact check it because it's very easy to be persuaded by just the mere presence of some authority figure and this is supposed to be this educated person. Um, and sometimes we could be just messing with you to see, um, to try and make a lesson out of it. But uh, this, was, this was something that kind of showed kind of the, the puppy dog kind of situation. Um, yes, I did correct them on that. I told them that the foot has nothing to do with your personality. So I, I think they survived. But another example of, of, of an experiment that looked at relationships between authority figures and relationships of the participants in the real world setting was in, in, in hospitals, I'm gonna start with a emergency room uh, RN, okay? If anyone knows an RN, you know how much education they get. They, they, 
even before they get into nursing school, they have to take chemistry, physiology, and then when they're in nursing school, they go and they get this incredible amount of knowledge, specifically about different medications and uh, how much of a medication should be given to a given patient, okay? So in this kind of quasi-experiment, we're gonna start with individuals who have the education to no different, but will they engage in the behavior anyways by the command of an authority figure? And so uh, what they did in this experiment is they had a fake patient set up in a room just in case the experimenter couldn't stop the nurse in time. And they had this medication, and I cannot remember the name of the medication, okay? But clearly, they put a label on it that said, if you give over 10 cc's of this medication, it can cause death. And for the experiment, we made that label a little bit extra big so that the, the nurse definitely could see the dosage recommendations, okay? Now, to administer a medication in an emergency room, you have to have the signature of a doctor first, and that doctor has to be part of the emergency room roster, okay? So in this experiment, what, we, what they did, I shouldn't say we, they did, is they picked a doctor's name, a fake doctor, that was for sure not on that doctor list. And they would call the nurse and they would say, nurse so-and-so, I am 45 minutes out. Can you go give my patients 20 cc's of this medication so that they're ready for me when I get there, okay? So here we have no doctor signature, a doctor who's not on the roster, and a medication that is being uh, dosed at twice the lethality. And the question is, is will these well-educated nurses who should know better still administer that medication? Now, I'm gonna tell you this. You didn't hear it from me, but if you're ever angry at your ex, this is gonna be good information. Anyways, anyways. Now, what we found is that 22 out of 23 nurses would administer a lethal dose of medication just by a doctor's orders. I want you to think about that. There was only one hero that would have saved that patient's life by saying no. But 22 of the other nurses went ahead and tried to go administer that lethal dose of medication just by that authority figure, okay? So now we have a problem. We know that conformity is really high when you have a relationship, a good relationship with an authority figure. We know that you have, uh, uh, when, when, when it's an authority figure, two thirds of people. But here we have a situation with real life consequences in a real life setting where a bunch of procedural rules are broken yet we still get this high level of conformity. And my question for you guys is, why do you think the conformity is so high in this situation versus others? I can't hear anyone, no. Oh, I said, can you repeat the question again? Why do you think in this real world scenario where we have uh, real action going on, we have procedural things broken, so we don't have a doctor signature, we don't even have a doctor who's on the roster, and we have a doctor who is not even present. Why do we get this high level of conformity with a medication that really could, even though it was filled with water in this situation, really could kill someone? 
why do we get such high rates of conformity in this situation? Yeah, kind of like a walk, you know what I'm saying? So you like, you kind of just like kind of give in, like just because of the label he had, or he or she, my bad, he or she had, it's like, okay, I'm just really set to this. But you saw our reason right here, I'm just really set to this. You know, just talk to my people for like 12 years. Did you hear that, Colonel? Kind of. Could you re, kind of re paraphrase? Basically, the fact that the the doctor, um, you know, has has more power, more authority, more education. Um, you know, our our society here, uh, Tajik didn't say this, but you know, doctors are seen as gods. Yeah, and it. You know, and it's real scary because this goes on all the time. And I worked in a medical setting um, where I actually got to go toe to toe with the doctor. What? And how did that turn out? Um, I well, I think I kind of won. I didn't like this guy. Thought, well, first of all, when you work in a medical setting, um, doc all every doctor has a different personality and there and some of them or maybe most of them are really challenging to work with and they're the ones the system is set up so that they are the god they have to sign off they have to order they have to approve and so it's so it's a very hierarchical system in, in medical care and as a social worker, you have to, your role is to advocate for your client. And so I had, I had a client with a head injury that really wanted to take a plane trip back to her home town where her boyfriend was. And, and this uh, guy, the doctor wouldn't, um, wouldn't approve her going on a flight. And, and there was no rational reason why she wasn't capable of doing that at this point. Um, and the parents wanted to keep her home and all this. And this is a woman in her 20s. And so anyway, so I just had to advocate. And so depending on your role in like, say, a medical system, um, you know, social workers advocate for their patients. And it might mean questioning a doctor. Nurses, on the other hand, their role is not to not to advocate for their patients. Their role is to treat their patients. Mm -hmm. So the prescribed role that you have in a setting also dictates your behavior. And right. we learned that a little earlier. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, nurses are like, you know, doctors handmade, you know, like mm -hmm. social workers are kind of out there on the edge though, you know, dealing with all the crap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think your comments and, and the comments of, of the students are kind of get to the conclusion of this research is, one, you do have that perception of a doctor. You know, we do, even though they're humans just like us, <laughs> they make mistakes at the same rate that we do. Um, they make the wrong decisions at the same rates as everybody else makes wrong decisions, which I know can be scary if you're under their care, but they do. Um, doctors are humans, but we give them a status position because of their degree and their education and their position. So there is that component. The other component actually has to do with the medical setting a culture in that in the medical setting, there is this this untold cultural rule that you don't question the doctor and i don't know if any of you have been in the medical setting but i've seen where a nurse does question the doctor or didn't follow the doctor's orders correctly or or whatnot and i've seen what happens to those nurses it's not pretty and so we see this organizational cultural influence as well okay and, and then again, I think all of these other issues that you've brought up uh, contribute to these high rates in a, 
you know, it's good to know if your ex is in the emergency room, not good if you're in the emergency room, so. All right, this one, I think I wanna to skip, to skip through a few of these. So I really wanna to go to a real, real kind of life situation that, that, that uh, expresses a different type of conformity, conformity to an ambiguous authority figure. And this happened in the late 90s, early 2000s. It happened in 68 situations in 32 different states. Um, what this, this individual who did these act did is he would call different fast food restaurants. He targeted re fast food restaurants, and we think he figured this out over years of experimentation, but he figured out he does this best with fast food restaurants. And so we'll need to talk about the fast food culture here in just a minute. And he would pick fast food restaurants that have female assistant managers, okay? And what he would do is he would figure out, he would call and figure out when that assistant manager's next shift was. And he would call during that shift and he would call until some male answered. Now, the male's position didn't matter. It could be the, 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 uh, the, the dishwasher clear up to a male manager. He just wanted some male to talk to. And what he would do basically is he would call and he'd talk to this male manager and we'll use the, the name Amy as our assistant manager. And he'd go, hey, is, hey uh, this is uh, Detective so-and-so. Let, let's go detect, this is Detective Johnson. Um, and uh, I am investigating a chain of thefts in the fast food restaurants you guys are working at. Uh, but I'm about an hour or two away from your fast food establishment. And I was just wondering, is a person by the name of Amy working there tonight? And the male, of course, would answer, yeah, yeah, she's our assistant manager, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, oh, good, oh, good, okay. Can you do me a favor? Can you go get her and bring her to the back room? because I think she is the one involved in all of these thefts. And so the guy being, you know, a good citizen would go get the Amy, the assistant manager and bring her back. And uh, he would say, put me on speakerphone and the, the detective, I, I need to back up. Okay, before the guy went to go get Amy, the assistant manager, at that point, the guy on the phone Detective Johnson said, stop calling me detective, stop calling me Johnson, stop calling me officer, just call me sir, okay? So no more calling me officer. And then he'd go get Amy, Amy would come back. And he would explain to Amy on a speakerphone, we think you're the one, we know you're the one. And Amy, knowing that she's an innocent individual, would protest, of course. Okay. And then let's say the, 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 the guy's name, his name is Jeremy. Okay. And so he would say, hey, Jer would you mind if Jeremy would pat you down? And of course, the Amy, who just wants to get out of the situation, wants to be done with this, says, sure, sure. So Jeremy would pat down Amy. And at that moment, the guy would get a little bit aggravated and goes, I know you're the one who is stealing. I know it. Will you lift up your shirt? Okay. Will you take off your shirt and let Jeremy pat you down? Will you take off your pants and let Jeremy pat you down? Take off your bra, take off your panties. And Many of the times, I believe it happened 68 times, about 20-something of these actually ended in a rape of the Amy's involved. But in 68 situations, this guy got some stranger to pat down a completely naked female just by his ambiguous authority. 
This happened in 68 different situations across 32 different states. And I, I don't think this is sadly, the guys at the fast food places, most of them got charged with something from rape to aggravated assault or something like that. But the guy on the phone has never been charged with anything because technically he didn't commit a crime. He just suggested that these two engage in this behavior. So the guy who actually did this has never seen a day of conviction for, for these crimes that went on, okay? So there's that issue that we should talk about. But so I told you that there was something about the fast food restaurant where this for some reason worked best. But what are the situation and influential factors do you guys think are at play that would produce this behavior and he would get away with it at least 68 times? What do you guys think is going on in this, this, uh, this situation? What's in, but the guy, it's the guy that's the perfect. Oh, why is he doing it? Yeah. Is that what you mean? What is, what, what is, um, what is influencing this dynamic for eight, for 68 situation, situation? Yeah, and, and, you know, keep in mind, so we have the Jeremy's in this situation. And I'm sure one or two of the Jeremy's or maybe even a larger portion liked getting away with this, but I'm assuming that most guys in this situation were uncomfortable with it as well. I'm, that's an assumption. Um, but what, what is it that created this dynamic? What, well, what why were they it? so influenced? Why were they so influenced to yeah. do this? Mm -hmm. The, the guys that did it. No, the, 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 the workers that did the pat-down. Anyone? Yeah. Okay. So they're thinking um, because the guy on the other end of the phone is a male and is in authority role that the 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 perpetrator the i'm going to call him the perpetrator the one that's doing the fondling whatever um that he feels he needs to um obey the commands of the male officer mm -hmm. well why do you all think, so I think that you, that's important. Why do you think though it was important that the female be an assistant manager? Why did her position in these situations matter? Okay, so Tajik is talking about maybe it has something to do with the fact that this the females are in um, authoritative roles, management roles, right? And that the the male uh, explorers. They they are they are uh, what they're I don't want to put words in your mouth they're they're doing what they're told to do to make things better or to protect the business. To do what? The female friend as how she as 
Okay, uh, so give us the answer. <laughs> I, I think I think you all are getting on the right answer. So one, you were, you're you're correct on the one end. The psychologists who have explored that suggest that the reason why remember that 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 person who was on the phone went from being a, a legitimate authority to a sir, which created ambiguity, which made the individual not sure what he or she what he should be doing which we have found actually increases compliance. The second factor, the assistant manager factor, when interviewing a lot of the individuals at these restaurants, at these fast food restaurants, is there is some gender play into this. That here you have this assistant manager, and here I am the fry cook or here I am the male manager and I have this assistant manager, Amy, who can question me. And so there is, they, we think, this male-female dynamic where you have this person who has no power wanting to assert some type of authority to show that he's willing to, as, as was stated, protect the company, take care of the business, to show that no authority of a female is going to uh, ruin my reputation. Okay? And in fact, a lot of the comments made by the offending Jeremy's what had to deal with, I was protecting my reputation as an employee to protect the company as was stated earlier. So, but really quickly, I want to get to and I'll end with, oh, we're over time anyways. So um, I, I wanted to get to suicide bombers, um, but maybe we'll do that another time. Um, is there any questions? No, this is fun. This will give you an excuse to have to come back one more time. What's that? I said, no, this is fun. This is the excuse for me to have you come back one more time. Okay, yeah, let's do. Yeah, let's talk right. about obedience because we're 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 gonna be looking at abnormal psychology too. Okay. All right. Thank All right. you. Have Hello. a good day, you guys. Take care. Okay, so I'm the